help strengthen. Um, the people often don't understand that the rent laws don't come from God. They, we have to fight for them, and we have to fight to keep them. And we have to keep, fight to keep them from being weakened and phased out. And for the last 20 years uh, or more, we have faced a fairly steady diet of defeat in that uh, we've gotten the laws renewed periodically, but the price of doing that has been a series of deregulation amendments that have cost us somewhere between 300,000 and 400,000 apartments that have been deregulated, mainly through what's called vacancy deregulation. Some people call it vacancy decontrol. The law says vacancy deregulation. Some people call it vacancy destabilization. But um, we are losing the system as we speak, essentially every time an apartment becomes vacant. So we are determined this year. The tenant movement is pretty determined. And it's all going to be over in four months and one week. That's when the laws expire in Albany. Uh, we are determined to uh, get something better than what we have, to make some real progress in Albany. I basically believe, and I, I think many people agree with me, is that our chances are much better now, given the shakeup in the Assembly uh, and the demise of Shelley Silver as mm -hmm. Speaker. Uh, Shelley Silver has talked the talk. He always says he's going to fight for stronger rent laws, and he has sold us out time and time again. And now we sort of know why. Uh, I don't know if any of you read the 35-page criminal complaint against him. It's absolutely it's astonishing. Uh, it's just brazen. Uh, anyway, um, Carl Hasty uh, is um, a... He, up until now, he's been what you might call a backbencher. He's been low-key. He's been chair of the Labor Committee, and he's been very pro-Labor in that, in that role. But uh, the joke in Albany is there we it's go. a very interesting <laughs> ringtone. Uh, the joke is, uh, and he makes this joke himself. He's actually a very funny guy, but not in public. Um, his favorite comment is no comment. Or he was like, my favorite comment is no comment. Anyway, now he's no longer a backbencher. He's the leader. He has to prove himself, not so much to us, but to the members who elected him. He's a new speaker. It will take some time before he is able to solidify his position. He says he is going to be more democratic, more open, that the members will have more input, that there will be, it will not all be controlled by the leader. The, Essentially, the way the assembly has worked traditionally is that when you get elected to the assembly, you hand over all of your power to the leader, and in return, you get certain perks. You get help if you have a primary uh, every 10 years when the lines are redrawn. If you're on good terms with the speaker, you're happy with your redrawn district lines. If you're on the house with the speaker, you find yourself gerrymandered into a district with somebody else, and you have to run a primary. This, this happened under Shelley Silver. Uh, as well as earlier speakers. Um, so I'm actually uh, fairly encouraged. And also, <clears throat> if you look at his campaign finance filings, he has virtually no real estate money. <laughs> now, that'll change. I mean, I'm sure they're at his next fundraiser, at the, moment the big landlords will be showing up. But, you know, from everything I know about him, he doesn't seem to really have any interest in the real estate industry. And we know Shelley Silver had a great deal of interest in the, in the um, real estate industry. Now, that doesn't mean we trust him or that we're just going to sit and wait and see what he does. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to put pressure on mainly our friends. Uh, this, art, this, this newspaper, by the way, went to the printer about a week before Silver was arrested. <laughs> so there's a lot about Shelley Silver in here. That's what happens when you're a monthly. But the basic strategy, as described in this article, is still sound, what we're going to do. We do not believe we can possibly move the state senate. The, the, the Republicans who are now in control of the senate, and they, are, they have a very narrow majority, but they have a clear majority. They are owned, lock, stock, and barrel, by the New York City rent, uh, real estate lobby. I mean, Revney, the real estate board of New York, spent almost $2 million last fall in independent expenditures attacking 
Democratic candidates for state senate and help them uh, lose their seats. And that's in addition to the money that they had already given directly to the Republican senators. So um, we don't think we can win in the Senate, and we think it would be a waste of time to try to move the Senate. It used to be that there were a series of Republican senators who had um, significant numbers of rent-stabilized and rent-controlled apartments in their district. They're all gone. Roy Goodman, Frank Padovan, Guy Valella, Nick Spano, they've all been replaced by Democrats. Uh, the only one who's left is Marty Golden in Brooklyn. He has about 22,000 units. We've spent a good deal of energy in the last 10 years trying to beat the crap out of Marty Golden, uh, and it's had no effect at all. Plus, since the last redistricting, uh, two years ago, his lines are much safer now. They took out Coney Island. Now Coney Island is connected to Diane Savino's district by a little strip of land running on the, sea, the ocean side of the Belt Parkway over the Verrazano Bridge to Staten Island. And they gave him Garrison Beach and some other very conservative uh, neighborhoods. Now there are local groups that are going to be beating up on Marty Golden, which is great, but he's not a strategic uh, target for us. Our target is twofold. The governor, who we have to keep, keep the pressure on, and our local assembly members who have to be told you have to make it clear to your leader, your new speaker, that this is an absolute must. You must work as a group with your fellow assembly members to say we can't lose again this time. And so we have to tell our friends no more excuses. You have to get this done. And they've got to feel some heat. And you know that's kind of awkward because doesn't everybody love your local assembly member? I mean, my local assembly member is Dick Gottfried. You know, I happen to think he's a great guy, but he needs to, he needs to really get in there and deliver. Okay, uh, let me just talk for a minute about the governor. Um, <coughs> what to say about Andrew Cuomo? Uh, they don't call him the Prince of Darkness for no reason. Um, but... You know, he, he does have a problem now in that he, he still thinks he's going to be able to run for president. Maybe not in 2016, maybe in 2020. He's, you know, for the first four years that he was governor, he, he almost never left New York State. This year he's announced he's going to make five foreign trips to five different countries, ostensibly to drum up business for New York State. Uh, to get foreign companies to invest in New York. Um, this is what um, politicians who have national ambitions do when they need to beef up their foreign policy credentials. You know, they go to Israel, they go to Italy, they go to China, and that's what he's planning to do this year. So I think that tells us something. Um, so he, if, he, if he does have national ambitions, he has to be somewhat concerned about repairing the relationship that is very strained between him and the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. And how that's going to play out remains to be seen. Uh, a bunch of us are going to Albany this Saturday, Valentine's Day. Uh, it's the weekend uh, annual conference of the Black, uh, Puerto Rican, Hispanic, and Asian caucus. It's the biggest caucus in the legislature. Um, and they have a three-day conference every year, and it's always on this weekend. Um, and we're delivering a giant paper mache valentine to Governor Cuomo at the, uh, at the governor's mansion. Um, and we're going to be putting some pressure on him. We're going we're to hit him. Okay, so that just without going into detail, that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, so that's essentially our strategy. Now let me just talk for a minute about what's going to happen in the city council. This is what is known as a double-header year. The, the city rent laws also come up for renewal this year and have to be renewed. There's a lot of confusion about this. Mm -hmm. uh, city rent control is a local law subject to renewal by the city council. Uh, and it has to be renewed every three years uh, after a survey to determine what the citywide vacancy rate is. And 
if the citywide vacancy rate is 5% or less, um, then the city council has the right to renew rent control and rent stabilization. Um, we just learned this week the new vacancy rate from the Census Bureau, which is 3.45%. That's up slightly from three years ago. Um, and, um, but it's still well under the 5% threshold. So city rent control, which uh, applies only to pre-47 buildings and for people who've lived there since before 1971, or a, a legitimate successor to such a tenant, like a, a family member, um, there are only 27,000 such apartments left. And in 1970, we had 1.3 million of them. So rent control is being phased out rapidly over a 45-year period. Mm -hmm. But um, now the confusion comes from the renewal of the New York City rent stabilization law. Some rent stabilized tenants in New York City are subject to the city law, city, New York City rent stabilization law of 1969. Other rent stabilized tenants are subject to the state law, the Emergency Tenant Protection Act, 1974, which has to be renewed in June by Albany, and administratively, there it's one system. There's no difference. The, the, <coughs> you know, the rent guidelines board votes how much <coughs> rents are going to landlords can raise rents when the leases are renewed. It's the same regardless of which law people fall under. But <coughs> we should always remember that the state, under our state constitution, has superior power and can always amend the local laws, which they have done repeatedly. So all the city has the power to do right now, you've heard of the Erstat law? Yeah. This is a law that says the city council and the mayor may not make any rent regulation law that is stronger than what's already on the books. So the city council has the power to weaken the laws, as they have done, uh, but they do not have the power to strengthen the laws. For that, we have to go to Albany. So um, we have to be always on the lookout for, you know, uh, an attempt to further weaken the law, and, the, and certainly the real estate industry is not going to be giving up without a fight. <clears throat> There's a number of things we know that they want. Uh, they want to undo the Roberts decision. This is a court case that found that the State Division of Housing, DHCR, was allowing landlords to deregulate apartments in buildings that had J-51 tax subsidy benefits, when the law says clearly, I mean unequivocally, that as long as such a benefit is being received by the landlord, the landlord may not deregulate the apartment. And the Court of Appeals agreed with a group of tenants from Stuyvesant Town who sued, and some, somewhere between 50 and 80,000 apartments that had been de deregulated illegally were put back under rent, rent stabilization. Um, the Court of Appeals left a lot of things undecided, like whether there should be a rent rollback, what the legal rent should be, but essentially these apartments are now back under rent stabilization. They never should have been out of the system. <clears throat> the landlords want very much to undo that. Um, Airbnb uh, is going to attempt uh, very seriously, and this will be all behind the scenes, as, uh, in addition to their expensive advertising campaign, they're going to uh, attempt to weaken the rent laws that would allow short-term rentals. The law in New York City has always been, since the, since the 1920s, that you cannot rent an apartment for less than 30 days. And that if you, you know, if you are trying to run an illegal hotel, you know, that's dangerous. I mean, people can die in fires or things like that. I mean, hotels have extra requirements like you have to have a second egress, you have to have all sorts of safety features that apartment buildings don't have. There are good reasons for that. Um, I don't know if any of you live in a building where you've had short-term rentals showing up, you know, people showing up in your hallway with keys and suitcases and sometimes having a lot of parties at night. Um, you know, people come to New York, they want to have a good time, right? Or they leave garbage out in the hall the next morning and stuff like that. Um, and you don't know who these people are and they've got all of a sudden you've got all these people coming in and out of your building uh, who have keys. So we're very much going to be vigilant about that. Um, so uh, 
that's essentially uh, the landscape. We, our, our number one goal is to repeal vacancy deregulation and to re-regulate the apartments that we have lost. <coughs> and, and we have got to let our legislators know that what they've done in the past, <coughs> which is to leave deregulation in place but raise the threshold uh, for deregulation, doesn't work. Four years ago, the legislature and the governor raised the threshold for deregulation from $2,000 a month rent to $2,500. It's had really no impact at all because uh, the big landlords will spend the money to get the rent up to that level. And they would be stupid not to do that. Many of them have apartments already renting for much more than that. So all they need is a vacancy and they don't have to spend anything refurbishing the apartment to get it up to the uh, new threshold. Uh, but the dishonest landlords will do what they do now, which is they simply stop registering the apartment if the tenant is told anything, the tenant is told, no, this is not a rent-stabilized apartment, and most tenants don't know what that means anyway. Um, and then four years goes by, all the landlord has to do is wait for four years and hope that the tenant does not file an overcharge complaint, and it is now too late to challenge it, thanks to an agreement Shelley Silver made in 1997, one of the worst of those amendments. So. Um, that's our number one goal. We also are, are looking very seriously to close some loopholes that allow landlords to jack regulated rents up to the point where they are no longer affordable. Mm -hmm. I know, I have three people, including two board members of Tenants Pack, two, two of our best board members, who gave up their rent stabilized apartments and moved out of state because they could no longer afford the rent stabilized rent. And in each of those three cases, it was because of MCIs, Major Capital Improvement Rent Increases, which I'll mm -hmm. describe in a minute. Um, one moved to Texas, one moved to New Jersey, and one moved to North Carolina. So we really do need not just to stop the loss through vacancy deregulation, we need to sort of tamp down on the ability of landlords to jack up rents. So we're looking to do three main things. Um, number one is to repeal the automatic 20% vacancy bonus. That's a bonus. It's, the landlord doesn't have to do a lick of work to get it. The apartment becomes vacant, they can raise the rent 20%. Mm -hmm. And then they can get an additional increase if they do additional work, like refurbishing the apartment, granite countertops, all that kind of stuff. Um, number two, the, the preferential rent loophole. Here's how this works. Um, the landlord said, get, you know, the registered rent is 1800 a month. The landlord says, well, I'm going to rent, I'll give you this apartment, but I'm not going to charge you the legal rent. I'll charge you $1,100. Anything that's lower than the legal rent is what's called a preferential rent. So they give the tenant a one-year lease. A year comes uh, to end. The tenant gets a lease renewal offer, but now the offer is based on $1,800 plus the rent guidelines because they have the ability, the law was amended, um, 11 years ago to allow them to do this on vacancy. It used to be they could only go back to the legal rent when the tenant moved. Now they can do it on, on renewal. So when you get a lease renewal offer, so people are, you know, they're facing, in that case, they'd be facing a $700 plus rent increase, mm -hmm. which most people cannot possibly afford. Mm -hmm. They move, the landlord gets another 20% automatic mm -hmm. vacancy bonus, and re and re rents the apartment to another unsuspecting tenant giving them one year lease. Oh, it's perfect. a scam. It's an absolute scam. Finally, the major capital improvement rent increase uh, program desperately needs to be reformed because this is a huge, has a huge impact on affordability. Uh, and it's just not fair that the rent increases are permanent and that they are compounded with the base rent. So our reform bill does a number of things, but the most important things that it does, is it makes the rent increase temporary so when you pay it off, it disappears. And it requires the landlord to list it as a separate surcharge on the rent bill so there's no compounding with the base rent. The compounding really kills you because we've seen buildings where rents have gone up 40 and 50 percent in like a four or five year period from what, what they do called multiple MCIs. And there's no limit on how many they can do. There's a limit on how much they can collect at a time, but there's no limit on how many they can do at a time or how much they can ultimately raise the rent. There are other things that we are 
looking to do, uh, which are described in this article, um, the tenant legislative platform. Um, we have a nine bill platform. Uh, if you, by the way, the new issue of tenant income is being mailed tomorrow. So if you are a member of Met Council, you will get this in the mail in the next few days. If you're not a member, I would urge you to become a member. There's an application on the back. It, uh, this goes out every month, sort of 11 times a year, uh, and it's uh, pretty informative. Even though if we, once in a while things happen, like Shelby said, we're getting arrested. So anyway, that's essentially what we're trying to do. Uh, it's all going to be over in four months and one week. The, the laws expire um, um, four months from next Sunday, the 15th of February. And so we have a lot of work to do, and uh, we need lots of volunteers, and uh, I'll be glad to take and questions. And more members. All right. I, I and more what? Members. Yes. Members. I would uh, appreciate it if you could expand on how to go after Cuomo. I know one of the ideas is putting <laughs> the changes into the budget, so there's... That's not going to happen. <laughs> There's no way rent regulation is going to happen in the budget. There's not enough time. He's trying to do too many other things in the budget. He's trying to force the legislature to agree to ethics reforms that they definitely do not want to agree to, uh, including limits on outside income. Um, and they, and he's, he's, he's got all sorts of attacks on public education uh, folded into the budget uh, that I believe would be very damaging to our public education system. Uh, I mean, he's really terrible on this issue. Mm -hmm. um, but there's some of the other ways to go after Cuomo. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not. I don't want to sure talk about some of the things we're planning to do. Well, but I just down. will say this: we are we're going to hit him. I know, but in terms of the club. Oh, you can send him. A, I think the 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 letter idea you mentioned is a very good idea. Look, the guy has to be somewhat concerned. He doesn't really care about this issue. I mean, ultimately, this is going to be a fight between the Assembly and the Senate. And uh, it looks like we're going to have some serious help from the mayor. And we've never had a mayor, right. ever, no. who made this a real issue. Then, this is an issue. Well, there, the, um, no. This is an issue, exactly. this is an issue that mayors traditionally soft pedal. We are talking with City Hall about doing a very big rally in, a, in April with which the mayor would headline. And so that's much more important that it, what's important is the mayor keeps talking about this. Most tenants don't even know the rent laws are up for renewal. So he's got the big, biggest bully pulpit in town. So the more de Blasio talks about this, the better. Uh, that's much more important than whether he gets on a bus and goes to Albany with us. So I'm, I'm encouraged. Uh, and you saw what he and Hasty did last last Sunday uh, when they went to Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, a very large rent stabilized complex, which is very much run down and where tenants have been hit clobbered with rent increases. Um, and I'm really glad they did it in Brooklyn because the real estate rap is that rent regulation only benefits rich white people in ten, in, in Manhattan. That is their that's their mantra. So um, anyway. Um, um, we, we have to keep the pressure on Cuomo, and he's got to be somewhat concerned about his reputation with the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. So, he's just, you know, we're going to keep pushing him and pushing. I don't know if we can move him. But ultimately, this is going to be a fight between the Senate and the Assembly, and we've got to get the Assembly to do what they call play hardball. The Assembly has to say, we will not do X unless the Senate agrees to repeal vacancy regulation, etc. That's the only way we can win. So that's what we have to do. Questions? Yeah. Um, I worked for a lot of years closely with Miriam Friedlander, who was very concerned with these yeah. issues. But the major thing was the home rule issue mm -hmm. and the fact that we don't, as a city, have control uh, where uh, we have, I think, a larger proportion of people who care about these things in the city, but there's nothing that we can do. The second issue is... Can I deal with that and then you ask your second question? I, <laughs> I hate multi-part questions. I only have three questions. Mm -hmm. And then you can't remember what the first one was or the third one was. Okay, we're not going to get home rule this year. It's not going to happen. With the Senate back in firm control of the Republicans, simply a non-starter. 
We also believe that it would be a tactical mistake, a strategic mistake actually, to push home rule. Because the fear we have is that if we don't actually focus on, on the main issue, which is repeal of vacancy regulation, we're going to end up with their raising the threshold again. There, there's been discussion among legislators about raising it to 2,800 and leaving vacancy deregulation in place but raising the threshold again. We can't let that happen. And I think the trap of talking about home rule is that that's, what, that's the result it leads to because there's not gonna, we're not going to get home rule this year. It's simply not going to happen. We ne by the way, you should understand the city only got home rule by... Uh, political accident in 1962. I mean, Rockefeller forced Mayor Wagner and the city council to take over administration of rent control over Mayor Wagner's opposition. <coughs> he didn't want it. And then Rockefeller took it back in 1971 with the Erstead Law. So now we've got sort of a bifurcated thing where the city has to renew the laws but can't do anything to strengthen them. But under our state constitution, the state always has superior power. So if we did ever get it back, there would still be a danger that they could take it back at some point, if there was a change in Albany. The second, the second issue, question. When, uh, you haven't talked about <coughs> the hopelessness of working with the governor, who, when he was director of HUD, miserably shortchanged New York City anyway and did a lousy job. So is there any hope that because he's worried about the progressive part of I this party, I only know what I said he's before. miserable uh, on yeah, housing. Yes, I agree. He tried to destroy the Section 8 program. Right. And we took him on <coughs> about that at that mm -hmm. time. But I mean, I have, look, the guy's very smart and he's ruthless and he doesn't care. You know, he's extremely ambitious, so how we move him, I can't really tell you. I can tell you that there's smarter people than me thinking about this, but we're going to keep the pressure on We can't afford not to keep the pressure on Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, do you want to follow up? Um, thank you for the very interesting explanation of everything. I, I just want to ask one clarifying question. Um, when you said it's a priority to uh, repeal vacancy decontrol, and then you had said something about, and also to get some of our units back, are you talking about um, re-controlling units Re that are already been? Yes, that's correct. Okay. No one can tell you exactly how many apartments have been lost because no bell goes off when an apartment is deregulated. The process is entirely under the control of the landlord. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we know it's somewhere between 300 and 400,000. And that's over mm -hmm. a 20-year period. The, uh, to look a little bit beyond, for a moment, to look beyond the four months, uh, de Blasio's plan to try to preserve or develop 200,000 units, what will this do to these rules? Do you think it's going to make landlords want to fight it more or <coughs> accept it or take no, the pressure? No, they're going to build. I mean, they're going to build this housing. He's allowing them to build taller and denser. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, it's... You, you can lose money on real estate in New York City, but it's kind of hard to do that. I mean, you know, we have a, a, a critical imbalance between supply and demand. And the city, the downstate region of New York State, has gained about a million population in the last 20 years, while the housing supply has increased very, very slightly. I mean, so you've got more people chasing a static supply of housing with more competition and less availability, and who does that benefit? It benefits the people who own it. So they're going to build, I mean, no matter what. Um, and uh, whether, you know, I, I've been a little bit concerned that uh, the 421A tax subsidy program, which is a huge boondoggle um, that, you know, costs us over a billion dollars a year in foregone taxes, which goes to luxury condos. I mean, we're, we're, we're subsidizing Russian billionaires and billionaires from Hong Kong who buy, you know, multi-million dollar penthouses in, in these new glass skyscrapers and don't even live there because, you know, they're just parking money. Uh, so they're not, paying, they're not paying New York City income tax because they, they're not residents. And we're giving them a, a break on their real property taxes. It's, it's obscene. And it's costing us over a billion dollars a year. 
That's very important to the real estate developers. They want that renewed. That, that, that law expires on the exact same day as the rent laws, June 15th. So they very much want that. And I, I'm a little bit worried that this may be a problem for the mayor because he sees it, I think, probably sees it as a way to bribe, bribe the developers to build this new housing. They're going to build it. So could that be the trade-off? We'll give you a yeah, renewal, yeah, but you could get be. rid of the vacancy. It is leverage. It is definitely leverage. Yeah. Could they increase the percentage of the rent that required affordable housing under the 421? Well, he says, the, well, they, that's one of the possible reforms. Because now it's 20% or something like that. No, well, that's not actually 421A exactly. Okay. It's more complicated than that. In, in most parts of the city, the, the developer gets 421A as of right without any affordable housing at all. Oh. It's only in parts of Manhattan and it's in a few neighborhoods in Brooklyn and Queens where they have to, in order to get it, they have to have 20% um, affordable on site. And it's not even permanently affordable. It's 20% affordable for a period of time. And that's one of the good things that Bill de Blasio is doing He's saying that whatever is built is going to be permanently affordable. We're not going to let them do what they did with Mitchell Lama and other programs where after a certain period of time they can just leave the program and go market. Uh, thank you, Michael, for coming. I'm a faithful watcher of your, your cable show, oh, um, thank you. Uh, which I hope everyone else watches too. What, what is it? Where is it? It's cable, the cable show that, that oh, Michael is Wednesdays on Wednesdays at 6, 6 o'clock. Um, well, it depends on what cable service you have. 34. If it's Time Warner, it's 34. If it's, uh, if it's RCN, it's, uh, I can never remember, I'm sorry. And if it's Fios, it's 33. I can't remember the RCN channel. I, I just want to ask a couple of practical questions about a couple of tenants in my building. Um, and they are seniors, um, and they are rent controlled and their rents have gone up and up and up and up to the point where they can no longer afford to stay in the rent control department. And the myth is that everyone pays $200 or in rent control department. I know there are people in this room that pay over $2,000 who have a rent control department, okay? Um, and these MCI increases, is there any way to challenge them at this point uh, to refuse to pay them when you when you renew your lease, uh, two of the tenants just got lease renewals, and their rents are literally doubled, fifty percent, um, because of the MCI uh, grants that were given, and they were not things that the tenants feel were necessary, such as a new intercom which works less well than the intercom that was before such as the new windows that replace the windows that were put in the year before the gut renovation. Uh, the boiler, which was inoperable, that had to be replaced. Uh, there, there's, we're talking about seven tenants in the 36 unit of gut renovated building and where the rents are sky high because it's in the West Village. What do I tell these two well, tenants? Well, first of all, if it's a valid MCI order, they can't just not pay it. Okay. I mean, the landlord would be able to sue them for non-payment and get them out if they didn't okay. pay it. Um, it's, it is really a very uh, loose program. I mean, we've always felt that certain things that the, the state allows uh, MCI rent increases for are really not improvements, they are maintenance, like, for example, pointing a building. Uh, there is a useful life schedule that if they replace a system within a certain period of time and that useful life schedule varies according to what it is, whether it's boiler or elevator or roof or whatever. If they replace it within that useful life uh, period, they, they can do it, but they can't get a rent increase. Um, but the only way you can really, the, the problem with fighting MCIs, and, and this is especially problematic in a small building, it's very hard to fight them without the help of a good tenant lawyer and a good and an engineer. Mm -hmm. And so, if you're a tenant in you know a, a 200 unit building, that's a little bit easier because you can share the cost of hiring the lawyer and the um, engineer. But if you're a tenant in a 12 unit building, 
it's a, it's a lot of money, and it's very hard to fight them without that. Um, and it is essentially as of right if they do what the law allows. Uh, and as I've said before, there's no limit on how many they can do at a time. Uh, there is a cap on collectability. They can only collect so much per year. But there's but but if let's just say for example, it's a rent stabilized apartment and the MCI adds up to 15 percent, <clears throat> the landlord can collect six percent the first year, six percent the second year, and three percent the third year. And in the meantime, you get another, you get it with another MCI on top of that. I mean it's. It's really a very bad system, and it, it desperately needs reform. Um, about the rent control, rent increases, the problem here is that unlike rent stabilization, where rent adjustments, and the, the law says rent adjustments if any, it doesn't say rent increases. Um, rent adjustments are voted by a board appointed by the mayor, uh, and in the suburbs appointed by um, uh, the county legislatures. Um, and we have a chance to influence that through organizing. Uh, or if you get a better mayor. Like, you know, under Bloomberg and Giuliani, we had very bad rent guidelines board members, people who thought it was their duty to help God, landlords. Yeah. So, well, God, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, but um, the rent increases under rent control are statutorily mandated, they're in the law. And um, when, the, when the maximum base rent uh, system went into effect in 1972, if your rent at that time was $200 a month, a 7.5% rent increase, which is the cap, would be $15. But after 40-odd years of steady increases, you know, your rent might now be you know, 1,200, 1,500, 1,800. I know people in rent control departments who are paying almost $3,000 a month. Mm -hmm. So just figure it out. If you're paying $1,000 a month, a 7.5% increase is $75. That's a pretty big hit for most people. In addition, rent control tenants get what's known as a fuel cost pass along, which is a dollar per room amount on top of the 7.5%. That does not exist in rent stabilization. And some buildings get what is known as a labor cost pass along. Whenever there, if you're a doorman building, whenever there's a new contract with the union, the landlord is allowed to pass an increase through what's called a labor cost pass along. That doesn't exist in rent stabilization. So legislatively, this really needs to be ended. And the statistics show that rent control tenants tend to be elderly, many of them are widows or widowers, and they have much lower incomes than other tenants in the city, and yet they're paying much higher rent increases. Uh, now, I just will say this, it's just a matter of time before we read an article in the, in the New York Post or the Daily News about some guy in Greenwich Village living in a rent controlled apartment with four rooms paying $200 a month, because there are such anomalies. But the reason for that is that unlike rent stabilization, where rent increases are, or rent adjustments are automatic upon lease renewal. Under rent control, the landlord has to apply for the increase and has to show that the apartment, the building is, is in good condition. So many landlords are rejected uh, from the MBR program because of bad building conditions. Some don't bother to apply. If you're a landlord, you've got a 100 unit building and you've only got one or two rent controlled apartments left, I've heard landlords say, you know, it's not worth it. And it's true, the paperwork is very onerous. I mean, it's, it's, most of the landlords go after this, they want every penny. So they apply for it and they, they keep the building in good enough shape to get it. But roughly, the last time we looked at this, which was five or six years ago, roughly two-thirds of the rent control departments at that point were in the MBR program and roughly one-third were not. What that means for that one-third is that those rents are essentially frozen. So if you read an article in the, in the Post in a few months about some guy, you know, or some woman paying $200 a month, that's why. It's a total anomaly.
And it's just a matter of time before we see that. Yes. As a person living in the neighborhood in, the, in one of those preferential rooms where I had 17% last time, I'm waiting to see what's coming up in floor, you know, and I'm going to have to move. Where is the rent? Is, is there, do you have any ideas on rent, where can I move? Rent stabilization oh. stock? <laughs> is there any, any neighborhood that has kind of a good bit of stock? I don't care if it, you know, any ideas? Good luck. Good luck. It's just impossible. Up to yeah. As I said, the squeeze is much tighter than before. And then the second, the second thing is, is when I look at those affordable housing grids, and I and I look at the income required, and then the rent, I'm, I'm saying, I can't at my little income grid working for the city, I, I I can't afford the rent that they think I could afford. So is there any way they're going to work on those grids and make it more reasonable for people? I don't know. It's not what I do. It's not right. what I deal with. Okay. Yeah. There are people who do deal with that, but I don't. Okay. Do you have a question over here? Yes, it is. Uh, I'm curious about what is the club that the assembly could use to get this... There's any number of points of leverage I if the assembly chooses to use them. The big one is 421A, which is a billion dollar plus boondoggle that's very, very important to the real estate board. Of the world. <coughs> uh, their rap is, yes, we can build in Manhattan without subsidy, but we can't build in Brooklyn or Queens without subsidy. It's not true, but that's their route. And it's extremely profitable. So they want it. They want it badly. There's another subsidy program called J51, which also expires. It's not June 15th. I think it's June 27th. There's the, there's the governor's property tax cap, which is a very bad program, very harmful to uh, municipalities outside the city, and, and very harmful to public education. But it expires, and he very much wants that renewed. Um, and many assembly members hate the property tax cap, and um, many local mayors and city councils and, and, and county executives also hate it because it's, 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 it's wrecking their budgets. Um, and, you know, there's another issue here, which is mayoral control of the schools, which also expires. This could all be part of the mix. I mean... That's not really leverage on rent, but, um, it, you know, we're probably looking at what they call one big ugly, a giant bill at the end of the session with, you know, that's 75 pages long and has all sorts of stuff in it, and it'll all be wrapped up in one big negotiation. That's what happened four years ago. Yes, in the back. The 20% uh, 20, 20 affordable, you said that's not permanent. How long is it for? Well, it depends on the program. Average, I mean, it depends on the program. I mean, Michelama, for example, which was a great, great program, one of the best housing program ever, allows landlords or co-ops to leave the program after 20 years of occupancy and go market. We've lost over half the Michelama rentals already. Say today, what is it? It depends on the program. Some 421A benefits last for 10 years, some last for 25 years. It depends on what what the particular, you know, subsidy provides. Yes? I'll ask a couple of Airbnb questions. Yes. Uh, do, you, does your, do you, Michael, feel that rent-regulated tenants should have the right to profit off of their apartments? No, I do not. I think it's bad policy. Okay. And are... It gives us a bad name. Are fair market tenants uh, also under the regulation of 30... Well, there's no such thing as fair market. Well, well, whatever that Market rate what, what is the word? Market rate. Market, Market rate apartment. Do they have the right to... No. No one has the right... Look, if you want... Who do we to complain some, to? If you want to have somebody stay with you in your apartment and you are still there, you are not violating the illegal hotel law. You might be violating your lease by charging money. Or you might be violating, if you're a co-op shareholder you might be violating the, the shareholder rules and get evicted uh, by charging money. But, it, but in terms of the illegal hotel law, if you have somebody stay with you and you are still in the apartment, you're not violating the illegal hotel law. The violation comes where people are not living in the apartment and they're subletting the apartment to strangers and they're not there. And there are people who own you know, or have leases on multiple apartments and they're just, you know, using them as hotel rooms for uh, tourists who come into the city. And Airbnb is only one of the platforms that, that makes this possible. Um, 
So the thing you have to remember is that you're not violating the illegal hotel law if you're still there. But if you have somebody stay with you and you're charging them money, you might get evicted. You might be, uh, that's called profiteering, that's the legal term. And um, you might remember reading in the Times uh, a year and a half ago about the, the gentleman in Penn South who yes. was renting you know, his balcony. You know, they have covered balconies, a lot of the balconies in Penn South. Are, he got evicted because that is strictly against the, the rule of Penn South. So people who do this should be very careful. I mean, there are people who do it because they have to do it economically, but but it is dangerous. And if the landlord finds out, you can you can find yourself in serious legal trouble. All right, I think we're done with questions. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you.